Bienvenue au Café Scientifique. Welcome to our Café Scientifique. My name is Jackie Rourke. I'll be your moderator. This is a bilingual event. Alors, pour expliquer, mon nom est Jackie Rourke. Je suis votre modératrice. Nous allons diffuser ce Café Scientifique dans les deux langues. Our topic this evening is Hidden Chemicals in Household Products. The discussion will focus on the health risks of plasticizers and brominated flame retardants and the concerns they raise based on two multidisciplinary research projects that were funded by the Canadian Institutes for Health Research. Le sujet de notre café scientifique, les substances chimiques dissimulées dans les produits domestiques. Nous avons cinq conférenciers avec nous qui feront chacun une présentation de cinq minutes et par après, nous passerons à une période de questions avec notre public ici ce soir. So we will have five presentations and afterwards we will have a period of question and answer with our members of the audience here. Our five featured speakers this evening are Professor Bernard Robert, Dr. Peter Chan, Hanno Eritropel, Professor Barbara Hales, and Dana Scott. Each will speak for five minutes and then we'll take questions from the audience. Bernard Robert holds a BA in bacteriology from UCLA and a PhD in pharmacology and therapeutics from McGill University, where he is now a James McGill professor in the departments of pharmacology and therapeutics, as well as obstetrics and gynecology. In 2013, Dr. Robert was elected as a fellow of the Royal Society of Canada. He will lead off our Café Scientifique by explaining what is an endocrine disruptor. And Dr. Robert will present in French. Dr. Robert. Bonjour, merci Jackie pour l'introduction. Nous allons parler des produits qu'on trouve dans notre environnement. Euh, ils sont cachés un peu partout. Les produits chimiques peuvent se trouver non seulement dans les substances chimiques qu'on reconnaît, comme les, les détergents, mais certainement dans les bouteilles, dans les voitures. L'odeur que l'on sent quand on rentre dans une voiture, c'est un produit chimique. Euh, les vernis à ongles, euh, les jouets des enfants, les habits que l'on met, car il y a des retardateurs de flammes dans les habits que l'on met, les chaises sur lesquelles vous êtes assis, le beau divan bien confortable euh, va avoir des produits chimiques qui aident à empêcher les flammes. Donc, on, en, on trouve ça un peu partout. Même, ne, même nos chaussures, beaucoup de chaussures sont faites en plastique. Il y a des plastiques qui contiennent certainement des, un produit chimique qui s'appelle les phtalates, la famille de produits chimiques dont, dont on parlera tout à l'heure. Pourquoi est-ce qu'on est inquiet de la présence de ces produits et dans quel contexte Là où on a une inquiétude, ce dont on va parler brièvement d'abord, c'est les la question des perturbateurs endocriniens. Qu'est-ce que sont les perturbateurs endocriniens Donc, avant de se lancer là-dedans, il faut d'abord savoir qu'est-ce que le mot endocrine veut dire, qu'est-ce qu'est l'endocrinologie, et pourquoi est-ce qu'on est inquiet d'avoir des produits qui pourraient modifier le système endocrinien. Le système endocrinien, en fait, est un système qui est remarque, remarque, remarquablement complexe, c'est un système qui a plusieurs tissus dans le corps et il a été reconnu par euh, l'Organisation mondiale de la santé que ces produits qu'on a dans notre environnement modifient de façon claire et définitive certains aspects du système endocrinien. Donc, notre inquiétude est d'essayer de comprendre ce système. Le système lui-même euh, a plusieurs composés le, le, ce qui comprennent le cerveau, l'hypophyse et plusieurs tissus dans le, dans le corps. Donc, et, et la surrénale, les testicules, euh, le, le pancréas, euh, toutes sortes de tissus qui produisent des, des hormones, tout tissu qui produit des hormones. Et le but des hormones, c'est d'être de, de, sécrété dans un tissu, d'être synthétisé dans un tissu et d'être envoyé à un autre tissu pour communiquer avec le reste du corps. Donc, par exemple, l'hypophyse va produire des hormones qui vont aller dans le sang et qui vont agir sur d'autres tissus, tels que les ovaires ou les testicules et la, la surrénale. Et ces tissus même, par exemple les ovaires, vont sécréter d'autres hormones qui vont remonter et réagir par rétroaction sur l'hypophyse et sur l'hypothalamus qui est dans le cerveau. Donc, ce sont des systèmes qui sont très sensibles. Ils vont répondre à des toutes petites, petites concentrations de, de ces produits chimiques. 
Et pour vous donner un exemple, le système le plus sensible, c'est le système des, des estrogènes. Les estrogènes sont des hormones qui sont synthétisées par les ovaires, mais aussi à un certain point par les testicules. Et ils agissent sur des récepteurs qu'on trouve à travers le corps. Donc des récepteurs qu'on peut trouver euh, dans les os, aussi bien que dans le foie, que dans toutes sortes de tissus. Et ces récepteurs ont besoin de sentir une toute petite quantité d'estrogène. De, de, Qu'est-ce que je veux dire par petite quantité Un gramme, vous savez ce que c'est Un millième d'un milligramme, un millième d'un gramme, c'est un milligramme. Un millième d'un milligramme, c'est un microgramme. Un millième d'un microgramme, c'est un nanogramme. Mais ces récepteurs peuvent réagir à des picogrammes qui sont un millième d'un nanogramme. Donc des toutes petites, petites concentrations. Donc il faut une petite contamination d'un produit de l'environnement pour que ça puisse moduler, que ça puisse changer ces récepteurs. Et à ces systèmes de rétroaction à travers le corps, nos, nos inquiétudes, c'est que ces petites concentrations peuvent changer la façon dont le corps va répondre. So in a nutshell, what we're really concerned about is how minute quantities of molecules that can target steroid hormone receptors or protein hormone receptors can enter the system and affect the cons uh, alter uh, different functions in the body, whether we're looking at muscle, uh, steroid production, uh, the ability to produce hormones themselves, making sperm, making eggs, uh, and to assess normal fertility, thyroid function. These are all the concerns. And uh, are they real? Are there enough products in the environment to affect that? Well, we'll be hearing that from our colleagues through the, through, over the next half hour. Thank, Thank you, you, Dr. Robert. Thank you very much. Notre deuxième intervenant sera le Dr. Peter Chan. Dr. Chan est chirurgien urologue et directeur de la médecine de la reproduction masculine avec l'Hôpital Royal Victoria et professeur agrégé de l'Université McGill. Dr. Chan has received numerous national and international awards for his research into men's health. Dr. Chan will discuss clinical concerns related to endocrine disruptors and he will be presenting in English. Thank you so much. Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. So uh, we're going to talk about tonight some of the impact of the household chemicals. Now, these are chemicals that were supposed to make our life better. Better plastic material, something unbreakable, softer plastic so we can do what it is supposed to do, supposed to make our life better. We always want better life. But now there was a concern that some of these chemicals, while they're helping us getting better life, they may have some harm to us. What kind of harm are we talking about? Now, let's look back. I think about, about 60 years or so, that's when chemists start um, synthesizing different kind of chemicals to make different household products to have better quality, things like that. Around the same time, in the last 50, 60 years or so, there was some research study showing that there was something bad happening with that. What are we talking about? Are we talking about death? Are we talking about cancer? Wouldn't they check all these things before? Yes, I don't think chemists intentionally put out chemicals for household products that would cause death or cancer. They, chances are they would know when you touch them, it burns your hand, well, don't use it. That's the that's basic idea for that. But there was something worse than, worse than just getting cancer or worse than death. What do I mean by that, worse than death and worse than getting cancer? Let's take a look at that, what happened. There were some studies showing that in the last 50 years that human sperm, the amount of sperm over the last few decades is declining. That is, sperm in men nowadays compared to 30, 40, 50 years ago is much less. So that's one concern. At the same time, the incidence or how often you see testis cancer, again, related to men, is increasing worldwide. And that's about the same time as we see the introduction of different chemical products happening. And indeed, there are some studies starting with animals, because animals, they live in the same environment as we do. They have a higher risk of having smaller genitals, smaller penis in the male animal. Alligator, for example, there were some studies showing that. And at the same time, we see the same period of time lower sperm count in men, higher incidence of testis cancer, are they linked together? And there are some studies showing that there was some link, there was some concern, to the point that they wonder 
if these, uh, these changes that we observe is linked to the use of these chemicals. So that's a big issue. Now, when we talk about lowering sperm count, higher incidence of testis cancer, these kind of stuff, this is scary because some people even suggest that that's the first sign of extinction of male. That could be worse than cancer and death in an individual. Now, none of these things is without controversy. There are other people they argue against it, which is why we have to generate a discussion. I'm not here to scare you. This is Cafe Scientific, not Haunted House Scientific. We're trying to bring up a conversation for that. But I think it is important for you to walk out of this evening to know a little bit more, to ask the right question. That's what we want to bring into the table for you. There is still a lot of question we have to answer with science, but I think we know enough that we can incorporate what we now know into new generation of precautionary health standards. We know enough that we should work with green chemists, chemists who can produce product, a next generation of materials, while they are great economically, but at the same time, it brings minimal risk to our environment. We need science to help us to answer these questions, and we need science to guide our policy so that we can make a better place bring us to a new era that has less risk to our health, to our children's health, to our children's children's health. I think that's what we need to bring the message across to the public for that. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Dr. Chan. Merci beaucoup. Hanno Eritropel is currently a PhD candidate in the Department of Chemical Engineering at McGill. He's working on the development of cleaner, more biodegradable plasticizers. He's a trained chemist and chemical engineer with degrees from the University of Oldenburg in Germany and from McGill. Hanno will discuss what are the chemicals that we're talking about tonight, focusing on flame retardants and plasticizers, and Hanno will present in French. Hanno, off to you. Hello, bonsoir tout le monde. Uh, je vais d'abord parler des produits chimiques uh, qu'on va discuter pendant la soirée, uh, une fois les plastifiants, mais l'autre côté aussi les retardateurs de flammes avec lesquels je vais commencer. Donc, vous pouvez vous imaginer, euh, dans le passé, euh, éviter des feux, ça a toujours été une, une, une question très importante euh, pour l'humanité. Et donc, déjà, les Égyptiens et les Romains utilisaient euh, de la lin sur du bois pour rendre ce bois moins inflammable. Du lin, vous connaissez peut-être ça, c'est un produit d'après-rasage maintenant. Euh, en Angleterre, au XVIIe siècle, par exemple, on utilisait du, euh, du plâtre ou de l'argile sur des rideaux de théâtre pour rendre celles-ci moins inflammables. Um, another important date is uh, in 1910, in England again, there was a, a new form of cotton, a new form of, 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 of clothing, for example, used in nightgowns that was called flannelette. And this was extremely flammable. And so in 1910, there were about 1,000 deaths related to uh, people burning because they were touching a candle with their nightgown, for example. So uh, the chemist William Perkin um, developed this new kind of uh, flame retardant that now wasn't applied on the outside of the material, but was, that was rather incorporated into the material by applying a solution to the fabric. And so um, he did that, but he also formulated certain properties that uh, this new material now would have to have. It would still have to feel the same, and among others, it, was still, it couldn't be toxic. That's something that was already discussed then and seems to be still a question today. Um, alors, quand on parle des retardateurs de flammes aujourd'hui, on parle plus des produits chimiques qui contiennent euh, euh, du brome. Um, et aujourd'hui, le focus, c'est plus uh, sur uh, éviter des incendies dans des maisons ou des véhicules. Donc, on trouve uh, des retardateurs de flammes de brome, surtout, uh, par exemple, dans les électroniques uh, ou dans des matériaux de construction comme l'isolation autour des maisons, mais aussi uh, dans du mobilier des maisons. Donc, uh, par exemple, des sofas, les matelas, mais aussi les sièges d'auto, par exemple. D'accord. Um, alors là, on va faire la transition au plastifiant. Un plastifiant, ça c'est un produit qu'on mélange avec une plastique dure pour rendre ce plastique dur plus flexible. Donc un plastique dur, vous, euh, ou le plastique dur le plus important, c'est le PVC. Vous euh, connaissez sûrement ça, le PVC. On l'utilise beaucoup dans la construction. Par exemple, en dessous de votre lavabo, les tuyaux sont souvent en fait de PVC. Puis on ajoute ce plastifiant qui est souvent un liquide pour avoir un produit plus flexible, comme je vous montre ici, par exemple pour des jouets ou pour l'isolation des fils. 
des produits hôpitaliers ou, ou des chaussures, par exemple. Euh, en fait, euh, vous connaissez même l'odeur des plastifiants euh, si vous vous achetez une nouvelle voiture. Et je suis sûr que tout le monde ici s'achète une nouvelle voiture rouge, comme je vous montre là-bas. <rire> euh, ça sent souvent le plastifiant parce qu'il y a des produits de PVC avec un plastifiant utilisé dans la manufaction, manufacture. Euh, ou, par exemple, euh, des nouveaux rideaux de douche aussi sentent souvent le plastifiant. So when we talk about plasticizers, um, the most important class of plasticizers are phthalates. Um, these uh, are compounds that are used uh, very, very broadly uh, as a plasticizer. And uh, now if you want to know where you can find uh, these plasticizers, unfortunately, this is not as straightforward as you would hope. Um, Some materials are flexible by nature, such as polyethylene, for example, your shopping bags, uh, whereas PVC needs this plasticizer to become soft. So if you have a soft plastic, uh, you will likely have to look for your uh, recycling symbol. So the one that I'm showing you on the top right there, if you see uh, that it has a number three and it says PVC and it is flexible, you can be pretty certain that there is a plasticizer in that product. Thank you, Hanno. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much. Our next speaker, notre prochain intervenant, Dr. Barbara Hales, est professeur James McGill de pharmacologie et thérapeutique à l'Université McGill. Elle étudie les effets nocifs des médicaments et des produits chimiques dans l'environnement sur l'embryon. Dr. Hales nous parlera des buts de ses projets de recherche et elle va nous parler en anglais. Dr. Hales. Thank you, Jackie. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about what we know from the literature and to some extent from our studies on the effects of the chemicals that Hanno has described to you. So we know that some of them can modify hormones and we know that that has an important uh, impact on many tissues in the body, um, including the ovaries and the testes as well as the brain so behavior can be modified. Um, we know that they can have effects specifically during, during windows of development in the embryo. So when you're exposed to these kinds of chemicals actually matters. Um, we know that they act on um, things like thyroid hormones. So one of the pictures I'm showing you is a thyroid gland. Um, and that The types of effects can be related to specific hormones or another. Um, to some extent, um, people think that maybe the types of effects they have on um, intelligence, autism, learning, uh, are due to some of these endocrine disruptors. And that's one of the questions out there is, is, is there an increased incidence of some of these diseases as well? And are they related to endocrine disruptors? So some of these are thought to be linked to brominated flame retardants. Um, and the brominated flame retardant grant that we received from CIHR and the studies that we've all been involved with doing have focused on the, the questions that I'm showing you on, on this uh, slide, which is really what are the, um, the effects in humans. Specifically, we focus on reproduction and on embryo development of exposing not to just any old random brominated flame retardant, because there are many of these chemicals, but we're actually looking at what happens if you are exposed to the ones that are in our everyday homes. So your household dust is actually your major source of brominated flame retardant. About 85% of all the brominated flame retardants in your bodies come from dust. And probably, we don't have any toddlers here, but if you were younger, you would have more. So your toddler probably has five to 10 times more brominated flame retardant than you do because they put everything in their mouth and they crawl around on the carpets and something like that. And maybe it has more effect at that time too. So then how does this happen? We want to find out the mechanism. So then what we, we are trying to do is take the same mixture of brominated flame retardants that you find in your household dust and give it to animals in an animal model to try to understand exactly what the mechanism is. How much does it take to have an effect? Because that's the important question that you're all asking probably is how much is, you know, maybe even if you clean your house every day, you know, maybe there's no danger. How much do you have to be exposed to? And then we have a group of colleagues looking at the ethical, legal, and social issues, and Dana will tell you more about that. But if you want to make a safe product, so if you want to have a TV that's not going to go up in flames instantly, or you want to have a upholstery and, and covering on your or couch, 
you by regulations, and this is to protect you, have to have a, a meet a flammability standard. And so how do you meet that flammability standard if you're a manufacturer without putting some of these flame retardants in your product? So it's not enough for the government, and we have some people from the government of Canada here who can tell you more about it if you ask questions afterwards, but it's not enough for them just to say, this chemical's banned, that chemical's banned, that chemical's banned. The manufacturers still have to make their products meet standards. And so they have to put other flame retardants in there. So one of the things that was not part of our original project, but we're also studying, is what are the effects of those alternative flame retardants? And how do we help encourage manufacturers to put safer flame retardants in all their products? And what kind of policy should be in place? So we can ask the same things for the plasticizers that Hanno also described. And a lot of the focus here has really been on effects on male reproduction. But one of the things we found in some of our studies is that they also have effects on female reproduction. So if we look at the goals of that project, it was to develop and evaluate green replacement plasticizers. So this fits exactly into the replacement strategy. How do we get good replacements? And one of the major um, contributors to this project was actually Hanno, who's made the fancy new chemicals that we've been studying. Um, we're also looking at the relationship between exposure to phthalates and male infertility. Um, and we're looking again at the ethical, legal, and social issues associated with these chemicals. Thank you, Dr. Hales. And finally, our last presenter this evening is Dana Scott. Dana Scott is an associate professor of law at Osgoode Hall Law School and is cross-appointed in the Faculty of Environmental Studies at York University. Dana is going to discuss how to protect oneself from toxic environmental chemicals as well as some of the social justice issues involved in precautionary consumption. Dana. Thanks, Jackie. Um, yeah, so I've been part of a team for the past number of years working on the ethical, legal, and social dimensions of the kinds of risks posed by these toxic substances that have been described. And basically, we're trying to address the primary question that people have right away when they hear about these risks, which is, how can we avoid them? And our research has suggested basically that we won't be able to avoid the risks posed by these substances by smart ethical shopping alone. So it's unfortunately, we won't be able to shop our way out of this problem. And this is basically, so we, we can tie it back to the idea that consumers ask for labeling. So once we are, we're faced with the reality of these risks being all around us, our instinct is to say, I have a consumer's right to know. I have a right to know what's in the product I use, and so we, we make demands for labeling. And the idea here behind a labeling campaign is that once we have the right information, we'll be able to make informed choices, and those choices will be in line with our own risk preferences. And this has been described by a sociologist named Nora McKendrick as pr a precautionary consumption, engaging in practices of precautionary consumption. And what we've been doing in our research is trying to think about from a broad regulatory perspective, is this the right way to approach this problem? And basically we've identified three uh, drawbacks or problems with this approach. Uh, the first is that it has a distinct gender problem. It's undeniably women's work. The second problem is that it just might be futile. It may be not actually effective at reducing the toxic body burdens for the people that are pouring their energy and their time and their resources into it. And third, and I think this is most critical, there's a possibility that it might actually exacerbate the inequities in the distribution of environmental harms that already exist. So I'm going to explain to you briefly uh, why, I'm, why I'm saying all this. Whoops, sorry. Uh, this is an example of um, a wallet card that uh, was issued by a really great uh, group trying to give people the kind of information that they're demanding when they hear about these kinds of groups. And there's lots of organizations that have issued these kinds of lists or wallet cards for people to take with them when they go shopping. So I look at this and I picture myself standing in the grocery aisle, right? And I have one child sitting in the cart 
dangling and the other child is briskly taking all the products off the shelf as fast <laughs> as they can and I think I'm gonna just pick out my wallet card and stare calmly at the back of each of these shampoos and try to find one that isn't going to interfere with the hormones of my growing child right and that's what makes me conflicted about these campaigns is I just cannot picture myself pulling it off and I know there are a lot of other women primarily but parents out there trying to trying to make this balance so for the research, we looked specifically at the brominated flame re retardants and the phthalates, and we tried to figure out, okay, would this strategy of precautionary consumption work? And if it doesn't work, what's a better alternative? And basically, for the reasons you've already heard, it's extremely hard to avoid these exposures. The, both chemicals are ubiquitous uh, in, in uh, our everyday environments. Um, and largely as a result of broad ecosystem contamination rather than being con con contained in specific products. To, to take phthalates as an example, we initially thought, well, if this is just in the plastic covering of food, then maybe this is a place where you could make, make smart choices and actually reduce your body burdens. And what we learned is that as a result of the broad ecosystem contamination with these products, they could be found in both conventionally produced foods as well as organically produced foods. They were already in the food before the plastic packaging was on it, et cetera. And so we had to conclude that for both of these classes of chemicals, uh, it was nearly impossible to avoid them. So just to mention briefly the kind of advice that you give are given when you ask for advice for how to avoid these chemicals. For BFRs, the advice is dust and vacuum frequently, eat fewer animal products, wash your hands a lot. The official government of Canada advice includes the helpful suggestion that you clean your house often, especially if you have young children. I like that part. And for phthalates, similarly, uh, you get the advice that um, frequent wet mopping is advised. So as you can probably imagine, most of this advice centers around food preparation, household cleaning, and smart shopping, and all of these are forms of domestic labor that disproportionately fall to women. Further, as you would expect, women vary dramatically in their ability to actually carry out these practices, and this is along socioeconomic lines, education, uh, um, etc. So that leads us to this idea that those risks are going to be disproportionately shared across the population. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Scott. This being a Café Scientifique, it's all about public participation, so now we're going to pass to some questions from our audience members. And let's start with our first question. Please, go right ahead. It seems like the problem with some of these chemicals are that we don't really know their impacts or at what concentrations in the environment they start to affect us. And a lot of them were introduced years ago before we had the ability to test at the levels that we do and do the kind of impact assessments that we can do now. Um, Due to the fact that they affect us over long periods of time, how can we be sure that new chemicals that are introduced to replace these products are not also going to turn out to have long-term consequences on our health? Who would like to handle that one? I'll start if you want, and then others can kick in. <clears throat> in fact, we can't. And let me give you an example. Bisphenol A is well known to most of you. Canada was the first country in the world to say we should not have bisphenol A in baby bottles uh, and in other materials that babies will be exposed to. And so you'll find a lot of uh, products that are clearly marked as bisphenol A free. But they still have to manufacture some bottles that are of hard plastic which is what bisphenol A will produce. And so the manufacturers came up with replacement chemicals. The two most common replacement chemicals are bisphenol S and bisphenol F that had never been tested for their toxicity. Over the last year and a half, several studies have shown that the toxicity of the replacement chemicals is very similar to the toxicity of the parent compound that was originally used. So why did that happen? It happened because we do not have regulations in North America requiring extensive testing 
for new chemicals that come in as replacements. And that was, in fact, the thrust of our phthalate uh, re replacement project, the plasticizer project, of saying, instead of just putting out a new replacement for the phthalate that may be banned, why don't we test chemicals and look at their safety first and try to see whether they are going to affect in vitro first and then in vivo, so in the test tube and with cells and then with animals, and try to find safer chemicals before we go to the manufacturing step. step. Same thing is happening with flame retardants, and Barbara may want to comment on that. Um, now that the government has, in, in many countries, um, banned some of the brominated flame retardants that we talked about, in fact, we still need something. So what we're finding out from our studies and from others is that some of these alternatives actually are more toxic than the chemicals that were banned. So the, the real question is, how do we go beyond this? How do we put in place policies or strategies or a pathway towards having safe alternatives, so-called green chemicals. I wouldn't mind chiming in too, if you don't mind. Please um, do. Yeah, because I, I kind of, I like the question you raised because it gives us this idea that in some ways we feel like we're on this treadmill, right? Like the risk assessments for each chemical take so long, they're so expensive, and it's like a regulatory game of whack-a-mole, right? It's like, get this one, no, get this one. And everyone has to invest their energy each time into this um, endeavor, which may have no end, right? So to me, it feels like we need to also spend our mind turn our minds to the question of consumption overall. Like, okay, so maybe it isn't gonna be plastic baby bottles then. So maybe it has to be glass, or maybe it has to be fewer of them, or whatever. Um, so actually turning our mind to, well, what are our alternatives by which we can reach these same social objectives, maybe without chemicals at all? Because the green chemicals thing will get us so far, but it might not get us off this treadmill, is my worry, anyway. Thank you. Our next question, please. En anglais ou en français? Thanks. Um, yeah, great question to follow up, by the way. Um, I'm not sure that I can do much better, but I, I was listening to Dr. Scott talking about how, uh, you know, doing the shopping and reading the labels and doing the cooking is, is primarily women's work. And I kept thinking, well, wait a minute, that's, that's what I do in our household. And I know that makes me adorable, but um, <laughs> it... <laughs> but... Um, I, I just want to get to the point that um, some of our exposure to substances in commerce is, is not driven so much uh, by domestic policies as policies elsewhere. And as trade barriers are broken down across um, uh, borders, uh, we start getting into situations where, for example, the flame retardants in much of our furniture are, are there in, in much higher levels than would be required by any Canadian standard, but it's driven by a standard in the state of California. So I'm, I'm not sure if, if you have any advice or, or thoughts on what, what we as, as the public should be doing to, to um, try and reduce those exposures or, or de deal with that trans boundary. Mm -hmm. um, well, I'm not sure. I mean, I think it flows both ways to a certain extent because uh, sometimes we'll be ahead of the game as we were on BPA as, you know, the first jurisdiction to, uh, to find BPA to be toxic and to take action against it. And other times we'll be behind the ball and we'll be working towards a standard uh, jurisdiction that's come out ahead of us. Um, Certainly, I think we, we're seeing a lot more cooperation and sharing of data and sharing of regulatory approaches across jurisdictions. I think that's great. Uh, I think there's energy both within the European Union and within uh, the United States on reform of their Toxic Substances Act. Uh, so we might start to see some momentum and, and get some regulatory reform in Canada that's inspired by those changes as well, and I think that would be welcome. Just as a follow-up, are any countries doing it substantially well, or are they regulating well? Is, is there, are there any examples that we could learn from? Uh, 
I think I think each country does it a little differently. Um, in Europe, they have a, a program called Reach, where the manufacturers are actually asked to provide information and data. I think what we have in Canada for many people is a good example of a proactive approach with the chemical management plan, where actually the, the government has prioritized many substances that they have set goals to actually have a risk assessment done in a relatively short time period. So it's a major challenge in Canada. I think that each country does something complementary and perhaps different. But as, as Dana said, I think they, they are talking, which is great. And they are sharing data, which is, which is very positive. Great, thank you. We have another question. Please go ahead. Hi, I have a question for Dr. Chang. As a uh, practicing clinician, um, I'm sure you give advice to, to your uh, male patients. And we, we know that women, especially pregnant women, are very concerned about their health and what their baby might be exposed to. But I've heard that it's very important for couples before they get pregnant to also avoid exposure. So I wonder if you could tell us the kinds of advice you give to the men who come to you for infertility or, or how to get pregnant? That, that's a very interesting question. I think ideally, knowing what we now know, um, the exposure that happens to put the individual at risk happens way before. Most of the data is pointing that the level, the chemicals that affect me as an individual is not what happened today or yesterday or last week, but probably what happened when I was a baby in my mother's tummy. That's how some of the data is pointing at uh, how concerning it is, um, which kind of reflects what you mentioned, and that is what can a couple do before they even try to conceive ahead of time to reduce such a risk for that. Unfortunately, most couple, when they come to see me or any doctor, is when they have problem, when they already have, try have been trying when it is already kind of too late. So that's one of the downsides, which is one of the reasons why we have to educate the public as to um, what kind of risk you, um, you, you're exposing yourself to. Now, it's easy for me to say that, you know what, avoid this, avoid this, avoid that. Guess what? These chemicals, as we mentioned, they're ubiquitous, they're everywhere. And you really have a hard time avoiding them. Uh, and they have been around. We spent like the last 60 years creating these chemicals and we let them loose, not knowing their toxicity. We'll probably need another 60 years to see what kind of impact it has in the human race for that. It's kind of like you, you're in the Titanic, you see the iceberg coming, but it's too late to turn kind of stuff for that. So you, you, you can advise them with different lifestyle, you know, avoiding the, the basic stuff, you know, no smoking, stress reduction, weight reduction, all kinds of stuff. But the chemical exposure, there was very little they could do. So that's why I tend to go at it with a different philosophy, and that is I like them to ask questions because there's a lot of things we need to, uh, there's a lot of questions we as scientists we have to answer. Uh, what kind of risk, what kind of things can be done? And we don't have the answer to all of this question. So instead of creating fear, I would rather bring up the concern, okay, so you need to avoid these chemicals. These, these are the kind of labeling you have to read to try to minimize the risk. I think anything they can do to reduce the exposure of their toddler uh, when the wife is pregnant with a baby could be helpful. But to what extent, we don't know. So it's more like an advice and hope for the best. So we don't have any solid answer to this couple, what they can do outside the basic lifestyle like quitting smoking, stress reduction, weight reduction. So that's one of the downside of what we have, which is what we're trying to work on to give better advice in terms of practical way to counsel this couple, which is what we need to work on as scientists and as clinicians. Thank you. If a couple is having infertility problems, are you able to identify this as being the source as opposed to other sources? Kind of difficult. The reason why is because even when we are studying specific chemicals, we're exposed to a orchestra of chemicals. You know, we have, they all have what we call synergistic effect. That is one chemicals with a, another chemicals. They can add up together stronger than the sum of the two individual chemicals. They can work together. So I think we are really exposing ourselves to a big cocktail of different chemicals. So when a patient, when a couple have infertility, sure, you may find that they have a higher level of certain chemicals. But the thing is that, is that the chemical that is causing the problem? We don't know. Meaning that it is not like, okay, there was a couple here. If I throw that chemicals at them, expose them, ah, they become infertile. 
If I take it away, ah, they become fertile again. It's not that simple. So I think we're exposed to many of these different things. And obviously, when we know they have harm, what we like to do is to reduce exposure, and which is what we are talking about, how, what kind of ways we can find out, how we can choose our lifestyle, the product. We have to try to minimize the risk that is acceptable to us. I think that's the important point. Thank you, Peter. Another question? Thank you for your presentations. They were very, uh, very interesting, and um, they've left me with a little bit of hopelessness. Um, I feel like I'm going to walk away here and need to convince my husband and kids to move to the woods or to Sweden. My question to you is, is there hope? What can we do as a public? Where can we head? Because I can't walk away from this feeling hopeless. I, I think there's hope. I think there's hope. I think we have done, we have taken some steps. Uh, the management plan, chemical management plan that uh, Dr. Hales talked about is very much along the lines of trying to identify and having identified compounds and determining whether in fact they should be regulated. I think there's a very big effort in the field of green chemistry. Uh, what you heard from Hanno uh, said that in fact, we can find replacements, and we do, and we have. And those replacements are not as toxic. We know that there are many efforts throughout the Western world in decreasing exposures. We know, for example, that many occupational exposures that have effects on reproduction. Let me give you another really recent example. If you remember paint, when you used to go get paint for your house, you would paint and it would smell for days and days. Painters have put a lot of pressure on government to have regulations to change the chemicals in paint. The toxicity of today's paints is much, much less than it was. So I think there's been many concrete steps to improve the environment, to decrease the toxicity of existing chemicals, and I think we have to keep on moving in that direction. And that has occurred because of pressure from the public and pressure from professional groups. Go ahead, Dana. Yeah, I, I, I think I see some reason for hope, too. Um, one of the things in our research, we've tried to break down the idea that we have to act as individuals and we, can, and we can only act as consumers, right? So if we start to break ourselves out of that a little bit and we say, well, we can act as citizens, we can act collectively, we can make it clear what kind of a chemical policy we want, uh, that, that kind of frees us up a little bit, right? So there's a woman named Jennifer Nadalski who writes about what she calls relational autonomy. And she said, you know, we can be creative and we can be responsible even when we have very little control. And when I read that phrase, I started to feel a little bit better, right? Because I was like, okay, well, we have limited control over these exposures. We're not going to all of us choose the seats and the upholstery and the drapes and the rooms we're in, right? But it gives us the, some scope to kind of be creative and take responsibility and act collectively. So one example is uh, something like a safe substitution policy, right? We can demand that of our federal government and say, we're not going to allow the, the more toxic alternatives to be used when there's a safer one present. That could just be a regulatory assumption that's in place and would, and would change some things, right? Uh, the other thing is a toxics use reduction strategy. So this kind of is a way of getting us off that treadmill where we have to go chemical by chemical by chemical through these risk assessments. It's the kind of legislation that would say, okay, all of these that are known to be toxic or suspected of being toxic, we could draw up a long list, you have to reduce your use of them over time. Like just, we're not going to spend our time and money on all of this, we're just going to start reducing our use of them over time. And that's the kind of thing citizens can demand. And if we work collectively, we can get towards it. Thank you. Just Jenny, a <laughs> <laughs> question, are you feeling better? <laughs> well, if Jenny McCarthy can uh, convince everybody that autism is based in, uh, in immunizations, I think we have hope uh, yet. <laughs> Thank you. I don't know, maybe I can ask you, um, what are some of the main barriers, if there are some viable replacements for some of these chemicals, then what are the main barriers to introducing them? Well, I can maybe specifically talk about the phthalates because, or the plasticizers because that's sort of been my work uh, over my PhD. Um, you can imagine these are produced in, you know, in a scale that's 
huge. We're talking millions of tons of plasticizer, for example, produced uh, uh, per year. And so if you know, if I'm a chemical company, I'm producing in this scale, of course, uh, changing my process to something else is a huge, you know, problem for me. So I, I drag my feet as long as I can to, 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 to not do that, for example. Um, and then, yeah, I think I think that is I think that's the that's the main issue. It's it's you know trying to get producers to produce better alternatives. So primarily related to the costs to the producers. Yes, in terms of for the plasticizers, most certainly yes. Okay, thank you. Another question, please go ahead. I um I've done quite a bit of research on the different products the greener products that are on the market. And uh, there are some, one company in particular that I'll talk about is Attitude. And they have a, um, a, a more simpler formula where they remove dioxins and carcinogens and, or potential carcinogens. And, um, and the problem is that this particular, uh, let's say it's a, um, a counter cleaner, is $10 versus the one that's, um, Traditional is, is $2.50. I feel that they're taking advantage of this new formula, this, this, this new age, and, and I don't feel that it's fair that we are trying to live a cleaner life, a safer life, and, um, and, and most people can't afford this type of product. So are there any, are there any efforts being done to, to make it available to everybody and that everybody can lead a simpler, more safe life. Which kind of was thinking, I was thinking along the same line. How, how well known is this issue? We've now all heard of bisphenol A, but how well known is this issue among politicians, decision makers, members of the public? Uh, industry, I imagine, is aware and dragging their feet, as you said, Johanna. How much awareness is there out there of this issue to spur that kind of movement on? Hopefully there'll be more awareness after this session, but <laughs> I don't think it's that well understood by the public. And to get to the questioner's uh, point, the, uh, I think part of the problem is that when these smaller companies come up with these products, the volume of sales and the cost of production may be in fact higher. So they're not necessarily trying to get you. I don't know the product, uh, but it, they may truly have higher costs to put them out on the market and to find the shelf space for them to be seen by the public. We've uncovered a lot of social science research that tells about people who take sort of one or two symbolic actions and then think that they're covered, right, and they're, they're good and they're protecting themselves, and really they haven't affected their body burden of those substances at all. So mm -hmm. it could be that, you know, we think, well, if we buy the right laundry detergent and, or we buy organic milk, then we're protecting our kids and we don't need to do any more. And this is why, and I completely agree with you, we, you know, we are focusing on the kind of the inequities of precautionary consumption because it tends to exacerbate this problem, right? Mm -hmm. uh, those that have the time and energy and money to do it are engaging it, but they're probably also withdrawing from collective action because they feel like they're taking care of themselves and their health and they're leaving everybody else out in the cold in a way. I think that anything you can do to avoid purchasing any of those products is, a, is the right message to send. And then secondly, if you have the money to spend on those things and you can approach it with an attitude of, I'm trying to send a message to the producers of these things that I don't want that stuff in my counter cleaner, then you can sort of justify it on that basis. But I'm not at all confident that it's helping, okay. unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Can I make a comment? So one of the researchers that um, studies flame retardants in Toronto has actually looked at what happens if you buy a new computer, get a new chair in your office, what happens if you live in a dense area like downtown Toronto where there's a lot of high rises. And she can do geographic spatial analysis of flame retardants, that's her area of research, based on high density areas, new computer, new office chair, and everything makes a difference. So everything you do does have an impact. It's just, it, it doesn't always show instantly, but ultimately it will show, I think. But it's not easy, as you say. <laughs> Thank you very much. Our next question. Nice. 
So I have a question about um, the regulation and the labeling of products that contain these chemicals. For example, I have a bottle of shampoo that says no phthalates, but if I read the ingredients, the fifth um, ingredient on my shampoo is methyl phthalate. So I'm wondering, is there any agencies that are taking care of regulating whether these products that claim they are phthalate-free or BPA-free or whatnot um, are actually free of these chemicals? We haven't looked specifically at the regulation of the labeling for those kinds of claims, but it, it is a really interesting thing to look at because one of the things we did find in our research uh, is looking at other people's studies of how the labels were so misleading uh, that they, were, they weren't worth relying on. Can, can I make one additional comment to that question? One of the things I learned from a recent meeting that I attended um, on flame retardants, actually, is that um, manufacturers don't necessarily know what is in the chemicals or the products they buy that they put in their products. And so there's, is, there's a chain reaction here. So I'm making a TV, but I don't know, or a car, or whatever. I don't know every single thing that I've bought from here, there, or there, and they don't disclose down the line so that the ultimate manufacturer doesn't actually know. So what they do in many instances is put everything on the label just in case. And it's not there maybe, but they, they put it to protect themselves. So it's a vicious circle. You know, sometimes they put things that are, are there and sometimes they're not there. And, and sometimes they in fact do not know. But who is responsible for the labeling I think is a question. Um, I presume the government should be verifying. There should be an arm in the government that verifies that, but I'm not sure. Dana, do you, do you know anything about that? Not specifically on this kind of point. I'm sh for sure there are regulations that deal with whether the labeling of products is misleading or not, um, but I haven't seen any research on those types of claims and whether anyone is inspecting, for example. That's probably where the where it really hits the road. You're coming to the end of a five-year research program supported by CIHR. What would you like to see done with this research? Perhaps each one of you could, could answer that. Now that you've put all this work into this, what, where would you like to see this now go? Dr. Robert? Five more years of funding. <laughs> <laughs> Spoken like a researcher. <laughs> uh, actually, we uh, discussed this at some length, and in fact, we have reached, I'm too close to the mic, we have reached some uh, conclusions. We have found that some of the compounds that we were testing are relatively non-toxic. Uh, we would like to be able to find a manufacturing outlet to try to test and use these compounds. That's one key element. The second key element is that we want to, to make clear that there may be very little relationship with, with, between some chemicals and some fertility outcomes, that it's not all negative. Maybe, in fact, some chemicals are pretty safe. And if they are, we want to make sure that those results are well publicized. So it's not all doom and gloom, and there are some things that we should worry about and other things we should not worry about. So getting the publications out, but not only in the scientific uh, context, but getting the publications out, the knowledge out to the public, I think, is an essential aspect of where we want to go. Peter, what about you? Well, I think um, there was a lot of work um, still we have to finish um, in the project um, to try to, like Bernard said, communicate the result of what we have to the public. But I think the next part, what I would like to see in the clinical aspect is to zero in to find out what group of patients they are really at a higher risk. It could be the case that, I mean, it's like cigarette smoking. People say that, what do you mean cigarette smoking is dangerous? I know my uncle, he smoked till he was 90. Well, maybe he was supposed to live until 200. So the smoking knocked him down to 90. So it depends on your genetic background. It can have different effects. So I, I think we need to zero in to see what kind of risk to what kind of people so that we can give more specific advice to the patient. That's what i like to see. But that is not going to be a five-year project. That's going to be much longer than that. But I think it will be worth the while for us to learn more about what to say to the patient once we know the exact risk of each individual who are at risk to have these problems. Anna, what would you like to see? 
I think I will echo a bit what Dr. Ware already said. Um, you know, I would love to see some of these compounds that we developed as replacement plasticizers to be brought to, you know, sort of a market stage. Uh, and then, you know, we have some, some additional features about these compounds possibly uh, being able to be produced from, uh, from bacterial fermentation as opposed to a petroleum product. So adding some value to, to that from that side as well. And then, you know, hopefully uh, convincing manufacturers to use this or making it cheap enough so that it can be used commercially. Barbara. I think responsible replacements. I think I would love to see um, policymakers and regulators and scientists work together to figure out a strategy to get good replacement chemicals because we certainly benefit from all these products. But maybe I, I'm just throwing this out as idea tax credits for manufacturers who support research that finds the best alternatives. There are strategies, I think, that could be put in place. And I don't want to throw away my computer, but I'd sure like a nice one <laughs> that works, that's not got flame retardants in it so much. And Dana. Yeah, I think um, I'd like to see people engage more with the fairness and environmental justice questions around toxics um, so that we're seeing people thinking not just about how they can protect themselves and their family by kind of shoring up this boundary, uh, but think about just trying to protect their environment overall. Uh, because of course there's workers inside these facilities that are being exposed to the same substances and then there's the communities that are around the manufacturing facilities that are exposed to the substances in their air and water pollution. So I think if we take a broader approach to it, we can maybe have a collective response that's more uh, effective. Thank you all very much for a very fascinating Café Scientifique. Merci beaucoup. Merci à nos participants. Thank you for your questions. Sounds like there's a role for the public to play in this. Sounds like there's a role for getting the word out. And uh, we hope you enjoyed our Café Scientifique. Thank you. Thank you.